Good morning and welcome to To The Point. This morning we are going to be talking about all those things you would expect. We'll talk about the budget, we will talk about the roads, we'll talk about all of that. But first we're going to talk about something else that actually is more maybe pressing at this mm -hmm. very moment than all of those things. You still got a little bit of time. We welcome Senator Roger Victory in. And while I know people are anxious to get the budget done, I want to start by talking about something you're new, uniquely qualified mm -hmm. to talk about because you've been in agriculture all your life and because this year farmers have been put way behind and in some mm -hmm. cases aren't going to be able to plant their crops at all. So let me let me start with what the state has already done. Mm -hmm. uh, you in the leg legislature uh, passed an appropriation for $15 million that will be used as the money to free up loans, low mm -hmm. interest loans for farmers and suppliers who haven't been able to get to their crops uh, yet or have losses from those. That may free up something like $300 million, Correct. I think. Yep. Uh, so that's what the state has already done. The mm -hmm. governor signed that a couple of weeks ago, uh, and that's already in the process. But as a farmer yourself in Ottawa County, tell me what farmers have been up against this year and the kind of impact that it could have, because mm -hmm. this is a big business for Michigan. That it is. It's, you know, in Michigan agriculture is a uh, one of the top industries. We have tourism, manufacturing, and agriculture. Those are the three industries we have. And uh, let me just start out very stressful. Uh, that we haven't seen anything quite quite like this in decades. And I've uh, even talked to those who are in their 80s and say, you know, we've seen droughts, but we had never seen a spring that had the continual rain. And what really impacted this year, you see some of the best of the farmland. You know, that's, that has a little bit more of that heavier clay material that usually produces that 200 plus bushel corn, never got planted. And that's something I have never seen before. Uh, as my journey is up and back to Lansing at times too, and usually they, uh, you see that lush corn growing along uh, Interstate 96. It's just not there. So, uh, and this is gonna have an impact. It's gonna have impact to markets. And what's unique about Michigan, we not only produce it here, but we do the processing. And one of the part of the processing is that corn, we feed it to our livestock industry. In, a, in western Michigan, we have a strong hog industry, turkey industry, and dairy industry. Let alone the dairy industry has been kind of in a depression state, been a mass liquidation. So now with the milk prices somewhat going up, now their input costs will be 30% higher. So it's a tough journey. Hog industry has been hurt by the tariffs. Uh, now they've seen the trade negotiations moving forward, so they'll see a little positive attitude there. But yet now again, being affected with these higher input costs. So it's going to be, uh, you know, it's stressful during the planting time, but it's going to be stressful through the whole year as we see these costs increase. One of the things that you've touched on, and I think it's important to, to kind of highlight a little bit, is the expanded nature. If mm -hmm. you are a farmer and you don't get your crop in, then you know that's going to be a loss for you. And we should point out that some of those loans provided for by that $15 million is kind of backfill. Mm -hmm. They still got to pay the loans yeah. back, but it's, at it's least, not a grant. These yeah. are loans and it's a low interest loan. Mm -hmm. So that is of some help. But so, you know, that's that's going to be a cost. But then probably you didn't buy your supplies because you weren't going to be able to plant. So now the supplier is out and perhaps you didn't need the extra equipment. So the mm -hmm. equipment supplier is out. So this isn't just about farmers. It has a big ripple. It effect. is a multiplier effect. It's going to be a huge multiplier effect in this billion dollar economy in the ag industry in, in Michigan and throughout the whole Midwest. But, you know, you capsulate it very well. It's not just the agricultural community. And uh, I know some of the suppliers, uh, agricultural or agronomists uh, suppliers are too. Um, you know, they ordered those seeds and it was a certain maturity seed. Then they had to ship that seed back, get a different variety of seed, ship that seed back, get another. And ultimately, uh, yeah, then probably didn't utilize that seed. And, you know, there's a lot of well laid plans that were designed back in, no, uh, let's say, January and February that never got implemented. And they actually went to plan D, I would say, at that point in time. And it's not just about not planting, and there's plenty of that, mm -hmm. as you point out, but there's a lot of uh, crops that have been planted much later than would have normally been planned, mm -hmm. which almost necessarily means yields are going to be lower. You are exactly right. You know, I mentioned earlier that some of this prime farmland that they always see the producing that 200 plus bushel acre corn. Well, that usually is planted early on and it has a maturity date of corn that will produce those type of yields. Now, if the grower or the farmer had resort to a shorter day planting variety of corn, uh, that yield potential is out there. It might be only 150 or 120 or 100 bushel per acre. So you're sacrificing that yield by this different 
different variety you had to plant for the early maturity. So uh, yeah, it's even though you might see that green crop growing, uh, the potential is not going to be there. Uh, and I think one of the, the folks in the Ag Department talked about 40 million bushels off for the state of Michigan. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it, this is a significant uh, yeah. event, even though other places in the Midwest probably got hit harder, mm -hmm. but we're certainly feeling it here. Yeah, and then there's some, uh, you know, the USDA is coming up with their numbers, and I don't know who, where, what fields they're looking at, but, but must be the best of the best because their, project, their projection is well, uh, higher than what you, uh, I feel what that's going to come on the bottom line there. So, yeah, we can see what the feds are saying and versus, I think, the reality. Uh, there, the proof will be in the pudding a little bit later on. Well, you obviously serve uh, in a number of capacities on the agriculture, appropriations, mm -hmm. agriculture. Uh, have you been in touch with USDA? I know the governor's office has been in touch, trying to get them to clarify or even relax some of the rules for some of the mm -hmm. help that they might be able to provide. Is that something? Right, important? not directly, but I appreciate the executive office moving forward on that and working with the director of MDAR on the component. But yes, making sure that uh, in a timely fashion too, because uh, you can't go have this set up to a committee and have a hearing back in September where we need uh, real time action on it. So they've been able to move the needle forward. I think we have some of the strong organizations at state level, the uh, Michigan Corn Growers, Michigan Farm Bureau, uh, these groups have really come up to the plate. You know, their individual growers and farmers have come to come and they you know been in Lansing and been in Washington DC, been uh, making sure that the legislative uh, our representatives are listening to them and, uh, and contact. We are in the midst of summertime, and that generally is a slower time mm -hmm. uh, in Lansing, or it has been over the past several years. This year, budget negotiations continue, and in our second half of the show, we're going to talk about that. But there's also some legislative uh, work going on. You have introduced a plan, and I find this fascinating because I want to relate to roads. I, it does kind of <laughs> relate to, to roads, uh, but I find it fascinating. A, because I know we produce a lot of mm -hmm. sugar beets, but B, I'd never thought of it in in this vein. So what you have suggested is a pilot program, if I'm not mistaken, yes. of about three years, to so use sugar beet byproducts to help keep icing off the roads. How in the world is that going to work? Well, actually, it's already been proven, and this goes back to when uh, back at the farm, uh, there's sometimes you put these uh, uh, solutions to add ballast to your tractor uh, uh, tires. So, and this is really getting the weeds, but one of the uh, product has been beet juice you add into that ballast of the tractor tire uh, uh, rims and that component so they don't rust that out versus uh, the salt solutions. So with that there, I've seen that firsthand uh, at the farm application. And then there's other states I've been implementing this uh, product because it has a you know, anti-freezing component. And so basically we will be treating the salt with this beet juice component, where it has the uh, anti-icing component. And one will create a, more, a little more adhesive nature, plus you can limit the application of the salt. And something that's been really important in Ottawa County, this was probably going back to uh, five, 10 years ago uh, with a lot of specialty crop producers of blueberries. We were losing a lot of blueberry production yields along some of the major thoroughfares because of the high salinity level. And so we, there was even water testing just showing that there. So this is, be, uh, especially for those environmental sensitive areas, when you drive down like 31 in uh, Holland, you see the environmental sensitive areas. Uh, with this way we can still make sure we have a safe driving environment and still protect the environment and making sure that uh, you know, we're not raising those salt levels up. Well, you, you say that it adds an adhesive quality. Mm -hmm. It sounds like it would be sticky. A little tack to it, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. And But this is already being done. They're doing this in Frankenmuth. That right? Frankenmuth in Minnesota, too. So uh, with a, And also another plus of it, it helps to preserve some of the infrastructure. So, so think of some of our bridge uh, apparatuses. Uh, how about the S-curve here in the Grand Rapids area? You know, that was rebuilt about 10 years ago. If the less the corrosive icing material that could be applied Applied on that hundred million dollar plus infrastructure, uh, we could expand that lifespan. So you know, we were talking about roads and those issues. I think this does not. Uh, uh, it's not in its own individual silo. But these are some of the you know talk about best methods that we can or best practices moving forward. I think it all comes into the whole road discussion. And are there certain solutions and things that we can do? And we all know what salt does to our cars. Could you imagine what's happening to our uh, uh, billion dollar road infrastructure throughout the state of Michigan? We are going to talk about roads here in a little bit, but this brings up an interesting question to me. How do you, as a farmer mm -hmm. uh, and as a, a state senator, help the agriculture industry to diversify by doing things just like this? Yeah. Because we know uh, with the current trade situation that some farmers' uh, commodities are being hurt, uh, tariffs are mm -hmm. hurting uh, others. So how do 
you, as both uh, an agronomist and a, a lawmaker, how do you help farmers in the state with what you rightfully point out is a very big uh, mm -hmm. industry here, uh, diversify and find these additional uses to make their profit more sustainable at home? Well, I think we need to create an environment in the state, at the state level, making sure there's not removing any restrictions and uh, roadblocks that could prevent companies from locating and doing the research. So uh, one, we're pretty blessed. We have a great uh, research university, Michigan State University. Uh, they work hand in hand with some of the uh, stakeholder groups. We also, uh, I think we have really created a, uh, over the last decade, a better environment for business to locate here. And also I think uh, I'm just, you know, using best practices and and uh, we have uh, like the MEEP certification process that was legislation that's uh, you know, using best practices, environmental best practices to give some certainty to the agriculture community. Uh, we have you know, right to farm laws here too. So I think we've uh, laid a solid foundation at the state level saying the state of Michigan is open to agriculture and the state of uh, Michigan is open to ag processing. Uh, we've just got a few seconds left, but I would, before we leave, we talked about the problem for farmers this year. We talked about mm -hmm. how broad that is, and it goes well beyond Michigan. Uh, as somebody, and you, this is really kind of uncharted territory, as you pointed out, but how long will we feel the effects of this? Because this isn't just going to be no. for this year. I, I say for sure 12 months, 18 months. Because as, I, as the feed prices go up, uh, the dairy industry, the hog industry, I mentioned the turkey industry, all those other areas, the, those input costs goes higher. Uh, then how about the planning schedules for next year? You know, do we have to put additional acres for corn to offset what we lost in those acres? A lot about the hay. I mean, it's been hard to get that hay harvested. The protein value in that hay is not there. So thus, that hay is being fed to those dairy cattle, aren't going to produce as much milk, which probably might be actually a plus for the industry because we have a surplus on the milk there. But for the individual producer, of course, you know, they need high production to make those payments on it. So uh, it has uh, a many different uh, trails of uh, legacy on this unique situation we haven't seen for decades. Senator Roger Victory is my guest this morning. We're going to talk about all those other things that they expect us to talk about. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about the budget. We're going to talk about roads and we're going to talk about auto no fault, even though that one's already mm -hmm. been signed. And we'll do all of that when we come back to the point. Welcome back to To The Point this morning. My guest is Senator Roger Victory. And Senator, I want to talk a little bit about kind of the business of the day. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about your committee assignments, because if I'm not mistaken, you are doing double duty on some of these, both policy mm -hmm. and appropriations side. And if my quick notes that I took down this morning, they include agriculture, which we talked about in the first segment, but significantly transportation, yes. and transportation comes down to roads, and that is a big subject. So you're on both sides of that. It's been the theme of lately in Lansing, yes. So on that side, I serve, actually it's unique because I serve on the appropriation side, vice chair on that side, but also have a, a seat at the table on the policy side. So the only senator that has uh, dual roles on the policy and the finance end of it. The, the question then comes to everybody that's listening. Mm -hmm. And they want to know where are we on the budget process. So kind of walk me through what you and your colleagues did uh, back in June mm -hmm. when you were passing budgets. Because the budget process has been going on. We know that back in March the governor uh, put her priorities out. But the legislature has passed a number of mm -hmm. budgets. But the process is not over. Correct. I, you know, I've been involved in uh, previous service as a state representative, been on the appropriations process there for a number of years, and so the transition to the Senate was fairly easy, a component very familiar with it, and basically have done how we've done it in the past, is making sure that we using the dollars we had available, bit, bit putting a sustainable budget to finance all the operations of the state of Michigan. However, when we were doing this here, we did not look at the road issue with trying to incorporate or trying to wedge it in. You know, there's kind of, you could probably fabricate some processes in there, but you know, we were going to, we have a budget here that we could operate our uh, state of Michigan, finance the schools, operate the, all the various de departments. But then what, we're, what we decided to do is take a, a good, solid approach, do a deep dive on the road issue. 
so that way we're not rushing ourselves or trying to just uh, fabricate something out. And uh, so that's been the process that we've been uh, doing of late. I've uh, been in Lansing practically every week here, uh, some long meetings and discussions, and so we're still uh, working this process through and uh, looking for a solid solution that's actually sustainable into the next decade. Uh, you know, it's not easy. You know, there's the needs of the roads. There's a substantial amount of money that's uh, needed for that component. If you're looking at for the next decade, we have some problems too that we rely on the gas tax component. But yet, where's the future? Yeah, I look at the uh, you know the Chevy Cruise plant down in Ohio. They're shutting that down. It's going to be replaced by a heavy truck manufacturing company that's going to produce electric vehicles there. So how you know? That's part of the conversation, and there's not an easy solution to how to start incorporating that, you know, the energy use into funding roads. So that's where we've been at and having some very robust discussions. Well, and so you point out one of the, the interesting problems, and that's sustainability and mm -hmm. what that revenue source is going to be. But the problem starts before that to figure out what's the number. Yes. Mm -hmm. And because you've got to figure out how to get there. And the governor suggested $2.5 billion, and I think everybody knows that she proposed a gas tax. And mm -hmm. what you're talking about is if it's an electric vehicle, you're not buying gas. Is that sustainable? But first of all, is that the number? And part of the $2.5 billion of the governor was really, uh, you'd bring it down to about $1.8 billion, or give or take, because there was some other money in through there to uh, backfill some other uh, spending proposals. So even under the governor's proposal, it was, uh, it was a in high uh, high billion pushing this under two billion. So that is a fundamental to conversation, how much you can uh, indeed, and also how much can we put into the system without creating a hyperinflationary inflationary factor. Because right now, as we discussed, labor's tight uh, and uh, any type of construction. So uh, do we look ramping up over a slower period of time? Uh, do we look at, uh, you know, what is a capacity? So that's been some of the discussions too. How much can we put in and making sure we have good return to the taxpayers of the state of Michigan and holding those dollars and getting a good return on those uh, on payment and construction? So in a budget negotiation in Lansing, and I know for many people, it's something that they don't think too much about. It's about a $60 billion budget, yeah. but much of that money is predetermined. Yes. The spending is already uh, worked out well in advance. Non-discretionary. That's right, because a lot of it's federal pass-through mm -hmm. dollars match and matching dollars that goes with that. But the Senate does a budget, the House does mm -hmm. a budget, and both chambers happen to be controlled by Republicans right now. And so now the 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 two chambers have to come up mm -hmm. with something that you can agree with them and they with you and then the negotiation Correct. with the administration mm -hmm. so we're still at that stage where exactly the because the house took a somewhat of a different approach than what we did in the senate and that really was a good exercise and we're looking at some of the things that they had adopted and uh and the process but it was somewhat of a little different approach and they're looking at more of the uh, something that's a gasoline the sales and use tax or the sales tax component and so what we can do in there but basically their theme is wherever you pay at the pump goes to the roads and right now there's a certain portion of that revenue that doesn't go to the roads but helps uh, fund K, you know, education and local government but in order to do that you have about 800 million dollars or probably just put a little sugar on it about a billion dollars and where do you backfill those dollars at and uh, and believe me if you're looking to raise a billion dollars uh, that is a you know in Washington DC they throw those billions around real quick at Lansing level that is a substantial amount of money yeah, and as you point out, if you did take all of that tax money out, that's going to be a eight hundred mm -hmm. million dollar hit to yeah. to K through twelve mm -hmm. alone. And uh, we know that there's that ongoing battle about funding education, and and so uh, that's going to be a non-starter for, for some right. people, no question. So there, there's also some finance things that they're looking at. Uh, that's you know it's a kind of a unique scenario there. I'm a, I'm digging into that component too and see, uh, but that what's where's that put us in another 30 years from now so there's a lot of short term long term and trying to mirror the short term or the long term it's not an easy uh, task because you know it's one short term and long term could be moving at a lot of different speeds and trying to merge that together without having an incident is not an easy task well and one of the problems uh, is too uh, that you talked about being in the state house mm -hmm. but uh, you still have a limited amount of time to have experience and understanding that longer term Correct. impact yeah. and how mm -hmm. it's going to work. So it's 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 a, a little bit of a matter of getting up to speed in the era of term limits. That's too. true. I, welcome to term limits. And I think that's uh, and that's why I appreciate what the House was doing because they have a lot of new members and they did a good exercise of seeing what, where, how and uh, the and the numbers behind it. So 
yes, I think that was an appropriate role for the House to do what they did because of the nature there versus on the Senate. You had number, more of the members have been there for a period of time, so they uh, have that uh, uh, little bit of the understanding. But yet, we're still learning from some of the, uh, what the House has done, too. So I, it's, it's a win-win for both. Let's talk a little bit about budgets and getting done. Now, in the time that you have been serving in the House, they have been done in pretty record right. order. Right. Under Governor Snyder, it was a... It was a hallmark of his administration. Yeah. So they were done in June and July, mm -hmm. pretty much wrapped up uh, by then. Obviously, uh, it's a different circumstance now right. because uh, uh, Democratic administration, Republican legislature, the budget needs to be in place mm -hmm. at the very latest by October 1st. For schools, their uh, fiscal year has already begun. So while they have an idea, perhaps, mm -hmm. and they've been through this before, they it is a little difficult. What kind of pressure is there to get the budget done sooner rather than later? Well, you know, there's some pressure, but that's why I think what we did in the Senate, we did pass a sustainable budget, giving some indication, giving indication to the schools and our local municipalities and those are operations of government saying, here, we have, you know, we have a strong economy, we have good revenues coming in, here's the, this budget. Now, the roads issue, we're going to continue to discuss that. It might uh, have some bearance on that, but at least this is this is a starting point. So I would uh, I would push back a little, saying there is a starting point. There's some baselines that we have uh, adopted a budget component, and then from there the roads is uh, its its own discussion matter. Well, and and I would agree you have uh, adopted a budget, mm -hmm. but there's still somebody who needs to sign that. Budget. Exactly. And, that, that's and, a, and, that, <laughs> and that part has it. But at least there is a frame. I would say there's a foundation there. And if you don't have a foundation. Uh, then where do you move on from there? So, but work has to be done. We have to build on that foundation. One of the things that I found very interesting early on in this administration, and when we were up at Mackinac Island, the governor signed the bill, was an almost for me almost a mm -hmm. surprise agreement on auto no fault insurance because there had been some oh, political talk back yeah. and forth, and then all of a sudden it came to be. This is something that people have been working on for 30 years. So does that suggest? that this governor and this legislature uh, are capable of finding common ground on other difficult issues like the roads. I think you articulate it just fantastically there. You know, an issue that was uh, there for 30 years, could not uh, find some resolution, and the, uh, the governor, the executive office, the House, and the Senate were able to come together. And I think a lot of the, gen the push behind that was um, we heard from the folks back at home. It was a grassroots effort of saying, you know, this is not sustainable. We need some reform. And I think when the, the pressure that we were receiving as legislators uh, saying we need some relief. And also, I think most people realize it wasn't sustainable going forward. And uh, in other parts of the state, you know, you have one third of the drivers not insuring their vehicles. Uh, and our costs were continuing to escalate higher and higher and higher. And uh, so uh, the pressure was put on uh, by the people back at home. So if that is transferable or translatable, mm -hmm. so it, could we, and, and I've been around long enough to remember those nights when we go up to midnight and stop the clock in the legislature yeah. uh, trying to get a budget done, are we going to be up against that kind of pressure or are you guys going to be able to get together uh, with each other and the governor and get something passed uh, before that deadline? I have, a, I have a positive hope that we don't go to that turning the hands of clock back just based on what we were able to do for auto no fault reform. That was a heavy lift. That was not an easy task. So the, the, the road map is there for it. And if we can continue to you know, travel that road, there's a possibility. But there's a lot of work to be done. I said the foundation's there, but a lot of construction on that foundation needs to be done. Senator, thank you so much for being with us. We're back with more To The Point in a moment.